the Russia situation. Hello and welcome. My name is Victoria Hansen and I'm the programme manager here at the New York Times for Times Journeys. It's my pleasure to welcome you today and to later introduce you to the New York Times Berlin Bureau Chief Alison Smale, who accompanies our July 16th departure. But why travel with the New York Times? Well, first and foremost, on every one of our departures, you'll be accompanied by either a New York Times journalist or subject matter specialist. For example, you could be travelling and discussing the Northern Ireland peace process with John Burns, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, or the Irish Opera Festival in Wexford with world-renowned leading expert Fred Plotkin. For each of our 25-plus itineraries, we have a range of small group tours and cruises. For the land tours, you'll be limited to no more than 25 guests. And for the world-renowned cruises, we use cruise lines such as Holland America and Cunard. We visit destinations that tell a story. We visit locations as diverse as Cuba, Provence, Myanmar, and explore everything from their arts and culture to their history or politics. And finally, we offer our guests exclusive access. We offer them the opportunity to escape the crowds with tours that include after hours entrance to museums, as well as access to attractions that are normally closed to the public. So here are just a few of some of the Russia situation tour highlights. With the accompanying expert, they'll deliver a mixture of seminars and Q&As exclusively for our group. You will meet Boris Notkin, the Russian TV presenter, for an informal discussion on Russian politics, Professor Zoya Belyakova for a lecture on the Romanov family, and Pavel Palaschenko, the principal interpreter for Mikhail Gorbachev. In addition, you'll also receive a private dinner on Kremlin territory and an exclusive after-hours tour of the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Exclusive to July 16th, you will be travelling with, as I mentioned earlier, Alison Smale, as well as receiving an exclusive private performance by pianist Sergei Dresnin and visiting Lenin's tomb. So now we're going to be handing over to Alison. She has over 30 years experience covering international affairs, specialising in the former Soviet Union, Germany and Eastern Europe. She is married to Russian pianist and composer Sergei Dresnin, and I'm delighted to introduce her not only as the presenter of today's webinar, but also as our specialist who accompanies our July 16th departure. So, Alison, over to you. But a big hello to everybody who is listening, and thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward, I hope, to meeting many of you um, when we leave on or when we start the tour of Russia on July the 16th. Um, and just to give you a brief outline of what um, you might be learning on this and why it is, you know, a thrill, I think, to be accompanied by somebody who has had the privilege of seeing this region as a journalist for many, many years. Um, so I, we would start off, of course, with Russian history. Uh, Russian history, a topic that has been much debated recently with the crisis in Ukraine, um, and something which I think all of us grew up with, the younger people amongst us perhaps don't have such memories of the Cold War, but I do think that the picture in most people's heads is still very much one in which the United States had a definite foe, a contender, competitor, partner in Russia. And to understand the nature of that relationship, it is very important to learn Russian history. Um, some of the things that have always struck me about Russia are how much it is a combination of old and new. I know that for people who grew up in the United States, Russia seems like such an ancient place, and in many respects it is. But if you compare some of the historical things to the progress which was, in which identical phenomena were implemented in Western Europe, you can see that Russia is in a way a very new place, much like America. 
I happen to have spent a great deal of time in a city called Yekaterinburg, which is in the Urals, right at the point where Europe ends and Asia begins. And Yekaterinburg, one thinks from the name that it must be an ancient city, but in fact it was only founded in the 18th century. For the third largest city in Russia, that is a very new place but it has great history attached to it, terrible history attached to it, in that it was also the place where the Tsar and his family were not only held prisoner, but also murdered during the aftermath of the 1917 revolution. So it is both an old and a new place, just like the country it is in. It is also a place which is both Asia and Europe. And this is a vital combination that exists obviously only in Russia, which straddles so many time zones and is by far the largest country in physical size in the world. These things are the reality in which Russians grow up and exist. And in some ways, perhaps, those things feed their inclination for a strong state, something which I would love to discuss and debate with you as we explore Russia together. Um, another thing that I think is always worth bearing in mind, serfdom in Russia ended only in the 1860s. That really is very recent history in terms of the centuries that Europe and Asia can draw on in other countries. Um, it is also perhaps um, very important to appreciate, as we will be able to, particularly in St. Petersburg, um, how the greatest flowering of Russia's unique Europe, European but also Asian-tinged culture occurred just before World War I. The Romanovs, the dynasty that you will hear about and whose palaces you will explore, had just celebrated their great anniversary on the throne in 1913. When 1914 occurred, World War I broke out and ended, as we know, with all sorts of empires collapsing, the Russian one included. It was then rebuilt as the Soviet Union, and that leads us quite naturally into a discussion of the scars of communism. It is actually hard to overtax, to overstate, sorry, what a gash this was. I often wonder what would the United States or the United Kingdom, my country, look like if the top 5 to 10 percent of the population had been lost to war, to famine, to terror purges, and to exile. This is what happened to Russia and other Soviet, members of the Soviet Union in the 20th century. It was a murder of millions, a killing of millions, a bloodletting that is so vast that it is perhaps impossible ever to account for it completely. When Mikhail Gorbachev came to power whilst I was a reporter in the Soviet Union in 1985, it is also hard to overstate the degree to which it was a shock but also to some extent a relief to be able to discuss the awful horrors of the communist past and to be able to examine what had happened to the country. That in turn, of course, led to a certain amount of what is now perceived by many Russians as chaos. Um, it certainly led to a vast transfer of wealth from the state to a rather few individuals who came to be known as the oligarchs and other leaders of the country. But as you can see, just from this brief description, it is very fascinating. There are so many wonderful things that we can explore, the way that humanity particularly survived all these horrors. Um, we will be privileged to be able to see the physical scars of communism, and to hear something of the psychological scars of communism. Um, the statue of Lenin that you could just see on your screen before is the emblem. Um, I think a visit to Lenin's tomb tells people more about Russia than many volumes can. 
And I would just say that I don't know whether those of you who are listening have been to Russia before or whether this would be a first time. I really do believe that everybody should see Russia once if they possibly can because it is impossible to understand this enigmatic and contrarian place, this place of so much culture and such brutality. Um, it is a, a unique mixture. Um, the psychological story, we will be able to trace the, what happened when the Soviet state collapsed in 1991 and what came afterwards. And if Tori, you could now switch to the Ukraine crisis slide. Um, there we have, very tellingly, a portrait of Vladimir Putin. Obviously, Vladimir Putin is a central a player in this crisis. Um, it definitely was not a crisis that is of his making alone. Um, Ukraine has been a weak independent state since the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991. But what everybody assumed until last year we could rely on is an international design of peace and security, an architecture that had held true since the end of World War II in Europe and in Ukraine's case was guaranteed by a 1994 agreement in which Ukraine agreed to give up its Soviet era nuclear weapons in exchange for a guarantee that its borders were inviolate. Um, and that guarantee was offered and signed by the United States, the United Kingdom, and by Russia. And it is that agreement, the Budapest Agreement of 1994, which Vladimir Putin violated last year when he sent troops, first of all, into Crimea. And secondly, he sent, well, what NATO says are Russian troops and heavy weaponry into eastern Ukraine to foment a, a revolt there by pro-Russian separatists. Um, I suspect that many of you are familiar with this crisis, but I would again love the opportunity to explain its complexity and for us all to be able to understand what a deep scar it is for Russians and Ukrainians now after a year of enmity. For families, for couples, for friends, um, it, these two peoples are so intertwined that it is hard to imagine that they have somehow been torn asunder in this crisis even if they physically still live with each other. And in the process of looking at the Ukraine crisis, I would very much welcome the opportunity to um, explain, I hope, a little bit of what formed Vladimir Putin, a former KGB man we know. He saw the collapse of communism in East Germany. He then returned to his hometown, which was then called Leningrad, now is St. Petersburg, and then moved to Moscow in 1996. At that stage, nobody, I think, would have bet on him um, emerging as a strong, long-time leader of Russia. But the way he has done this, the, kind, the way he has harked back to Russian Orthodox Christianity, to the strong state tradition of Russia, and the way he has done this, however, in a market economy of a definite uh, different stripe than the one that we are used to, but he is not someone who harks back to communist uh, dogma of economy at all. Um, and weaving all this together has been my privilege in reporting for the Associated Press and then for the New York Times over a long, long career spent mostly in Europe. Um, I would love to have the chance to share some of the great experiences that this privileged career has given me. Um, I was in Berlin the night the wall fell. I covered the revolutions across Eastern Europe. Um, I also then covered the very tragic war in Yugoslavia, um, which I think had a direct uh, link to a later war in Kosovo. Um, all of which is worth bearing in mind when we now look at the Ukraine crisis and tend to think, well, 
but there hasn't been a crisis like this since World War II. Well, there have been wars in Europe um, in between 1945 and now. And without dwelling too much on the horrors, but I think imparting some lessons, I would love to discuss this. Plus, just the actually, you know, despite all the misery, sheer joy and good time that you can have in Central, Eastern, and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. I have been reporting on this territory since the late 1970s which makes me older than Methuselah at this point, and certainly older than, say, the Greek Prime Minister who's visiting uh, Berlin at the moment. But I would love to share with you whatever you think would be, would enrich your knowledge of this wonderful part of Europe, something, a region that is still perhaps little known. And I'm not sure if that helps you to understand in depth, but if you have any questions, I really would be happy to answer them. And as I say, look forward to showing you my beloved Russia. Thank you very much, Alison. As um, I feel like I've learned so much in the last ten minutes, let alone what I would learn on a on a tour with you for for nine days. So I'm sure that the attendees for today's webinar will feel the same and and look forward to to joining you. So. With um, as you mentioned, we're now going to move on to questions. Um, on the screen, you'll see a number of the the frequently asked questions that we get. Um, international airfare being uh, being the main one. Um, so quite often, people ask, "Is it included?" But at the same time, say we want to be able to use our air miles, and because of that, we don't include um, the international airfare in the tour price themselves because we do want to give you the flexibility to book however you choose. This isn't a particularly active tour, however, there are. Um, walking tours that form part of the itinerary um, and because of that we do ask that you can walk two to three miles unassisted and by all means if you're traveling on your own please do please do join us um, quite often people travel um, travel as a single a single traveler but then they meet friends along the way and quite often are still in touch with them for many years afterwards um, and we will be announcing the experts that accompany the later departures very shortly. Now those are the some of the questions that we have that I wanted to just cover off, um, cover off immediately however I'm now going to open it up to the floor as well and ask, ask if any of our attendees have any questions themselves. There is a panel um, on the right hand side for questions you can type anything in that you'd that you'd like to either ask Alison directly or um, for me with regards to more of the the tour logistics um, we do find that we have people that join from from all walks of life and because of that the questions and the conversations that take place during the trip are some very interesting sometimes heated um, but that way you get a, a real experience for the flavors um, both among the guests and also an understanding of of uh, of the topics being discussed too so another question that's just come in is around the hotels. Now all of the, the hotels are luxury hotels. We have two that we stay in during the, uh, during the program. We stay in the Marriott Royal Aurora in Moscow and the Belmont Grand Hotel in St. Petersburg. They're some of the finest available and the food goes hand in hand with that as well. So we always make sure that you get to enjoy some of the best cuisine possible. Um, somebody's just asked, is it safe to travel to Russia? Well, yes, we would not be um, running a tour to somewhere that we didn't think was safe. In addition, um, I should mention this trip is operated by Abercrombie and Kent, a uh, world-renowned uh, tour operator, and they actually have uh, offices in the ground in, uh, on the ground in Russia as well. And so they're monitoring as well as we are um, on the ground situations on a daily basis. Um, and as such, if there were any um, changes that we needed to notify guests about, then we would be doing that immediately. So please have no hesitation at all. Um, this is a fascinating um, country to visit, and um, I'm sure you'll have 
an amazing uh, time touring with us. This isn't um, a trip that you get to experience with somebody with, with Alison's um, extensive uh, knowledge very often. So, um, as I say, a once in a lifetime opportunity there. Yes, Alison, if I could just, yes, if I could just um, throw in my two cents there. I mean, obviously, as soon as one says this, one is destined to be proved wrong, but I have never been robbed or really felt harassed or threatened in over 30 years of visiting Russia. Um, and I think that this, it's a bit of a cliche, but generally speaking, Russians are extremely hospitable to foreign visitors. They may bristle a bit at foreign visitors' questions if those challenge Russians' ideas, but what they do love is a good discussion. Great, thank you. That's that's really important to have that on the ground um, experience. I haven't been to Russia myself as yet, so this would be um, it's great to get your your take on that. Um, I think those are all of the questions that have come in right now. Um, so, Alison, do you have any parting comments? Parting comments. Um, just looking at some of the pictures, especially the Russian cupolas that I can see now on top of one of the Kremlin cathedrals, uh, really does make me want to go back there and with a group of lively, interested Times readers, people who are clearly curious about the world, and as I say, to share some of the love and the the less love that I have for this marvelous country. And, oh, we were just about to disappear, and then we've got a question up. Do we include any literary experiences on the trip? Um, well, one of the well, sorry, get you go ahead. No, if by I, it depends what you mean about by literary experiences. If what you mean is I don't know tracing the setting of crime and punishment in St. Petersburg, I'm sure we can somehow incorporate that. Is that what you meant, or would, are you thinking that you would like to meet writers or something? Um, there hasn't been a reply yet. Um, however, what I would also say on that note is that. Um, we do meet with Zoya Balyakova, who's um, very experienced in the Romanov dynasty, um, and she's written um, books around that. So obviously that's more um, history rather than um, uh, a, a literary story. However, um, there are different aspects that could be um, covered. And I think and we will, I mean, just by walking through St. Petersburg, especially, you really are, you know, right in the setting of many of Russia's most famous works. And we can certainly talk about the Chekhovian atmosphere of our summers at the Dacha and so on. I, I think if what you're looking for is the kind of the real life context to marvelous Russian literature that you've read, you would find yourself very satisfied. They've actually just replied and said, no, they're talking about the environment surrounding uh, Dostoevsky. Um, yeah. So I think that that answered that one. And in addition, we um, also provide our guests with a reading list as well that would be able to talk to some of the topics covered, which I think you'd find very interesting too. Um, I'm just going to run very quickly through um, the itinerary on a on a day by day basis. So this is a nine day tour. We start off uh, in Moscow before proceeding over to St. Petersburg. Um, so some of the highlights of, of Moscow were the, the tour of the Kremlin, the Red Square, uh, discussing the Cold War, including um, a visit to a top secret bunker, former top secret bunker, I should say, um, as well as a visit to the Gorbachev Foundation, where, as I mentioned earlier, you'll meet with Mikhail Gorbachev's uh, former translator. Whilst in St. Petersburg, you'll meet uh, Professor Zoya Balyakova. Um, you'll also have the opportunity for an after hours tour of the Hermitage. Um, visiting uh, Zarco Cello and Catherine's Palace, including the Amber Room. Um, 
and then on for um, a private tour of the Grand Palace in, in Peterhof before finishing the trip in St. Petersburg and, and heading home. Now, all of this, um, we have three departures, July 16th, which is the one accompanied by Alison, August the 13th and September the 3rd. Each of these are limited to just 18 guests. So it's very, um, very small groups indeed. Um, if you do have any questions that we haven't answered now, then you can call our, our specialist travel um, team on 855-698-7979 and they'll be able to help you. Um, as I say, this is limited to 18 guests. For nine days, it's $10,795. Um, if you're traveling on your own, then in addition, there is a single supplement of $1,595. Um, however, as I say, if you'd like any additional information, our call center is there on 855-698-7979. Or for um, the website, you can have a look at nytimes dot com forward slash times dash journeys um, the uh, url is at the bottom of the screen there as well and we will be posting this webinar online so you'll be able to re-listen to this again and we'll email all of our attendees a link directly so that you can revisit this too i know it's very easy to um to think of questions immediately after a presentation so don't worry, there are plenty of opportunities to do that. But as I say, we are limited to only 18 guests and uh, there are only three departures and there's certainly only one departure with Alison's mail. So Alison, thank you very much again for your time today. It was fantastic to have you join, especially from Berlin, the wonders of modern day technology. <laughs> when it finally works <laughs> we got there in the end um, and so please everybody give us a call on 855-698-7979 and we look forward to seeing you in Russia very shortly thank you